For those who don't know me, my name is Matthew Lalano. However, today, the picture is a little bit more complicated. You've got insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. They go together, and we'll see that. Body size, we need the BMI and the central adiposity. Those things increase. <laughs> the chemical formula of glucose is C6H12O6. If I were to take that and divide everything by 6, I would get 2 CH2O, right? This, the C, that's carbon. This is water. Carbohydrate. We, we're also going to talk about a little bit about anti uh, or angiogenesis and anti-angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels. And this is very important when you're a cancer cell and you're trying to grow very fast. You need to get some nutrients out of the bloodstream. You need to form new blood vessels. So it's thought that compounds that are anti-angiogenic that prevent that are helpful against cancer. This is interesting. High fat diets and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That was the, the quote when the media covered this. They're trying to convince people that you know, a high fat diet is going to give you liver disease. And I look at that, I'm like, all right, I, I, want to, I want to see what's going on. And you look in the details and the high fat diet, of course, the fat all comes from corn oil. Is this realistic? Well, this study estimates that about 20% of Americans, the upper quintile, consumes up to or more than 110 grams of fructose per day, coming in the form of added sugars, in the form of high fructose corn syrup, and other sweeteners. So if you, about 20% of the population is not too far away from that 200 grams per day. This uh, study here, a study of 1,400 eighth graders, estimates that the fructose consumption from added sugars ranges from 47 to 122 grams per day. So again, there's a population that is getting close to that amount. It's not super unrealistic. And I've seen higher levels in other studies. And in this one, it estimates about 11 to 12% of preschoolers are ingesting more than 25% of total energy in the form of added sugars quarter of total calories in the form of added sugars. And we wonder why child obesity is increasing, okay? So now we're talking about post-workout nutrition. Not only that, it also depends on the training level of the athlete. I ask one untrained individual to do grace, 30 clean and jerks for time, and the person does one clean and jerk every minute. I'm like, well, that's kind of like a West Side barbell, you know, workout. It's like you, 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 know, you can have some protein after that and you'll be fine, but someone finishes it in under two minutes, it's like you go have a, yourself you know, two or three sweet potatoes there, buddy, you'll, you, you need it. Yeah, so the question is, doesn't that fly in the face of CrossFit's philosophy and of training the unknown and the unknowable? Again, what is your goal? Like, if your goal is to excel at CrossFit, you have no choice but to play that game. If your goal is you know, health and longevity and performance, you don't necessarily have to play that game. Uh, if, you know, if, you know I, I look at a lot of CrossFitters and they just, they, they do CrossFit.com wads, they don't ask any questions. I think it's too much volume and too high of an intensity with most people who don't even have the basic buy-in of skills to do it. And then the, what happens is that they're typically very deconditioned. So you ask a deconditioned person to do those types of workouts and they will get better, but then they're gonna hit a plateau because you now probably there's some overtraining going on or too much cortisol production. They may not be feeding themselves properly. And they expect to you know, get a better Fran time every time that they do it, but they're doing it randomly and they're not training for it. Like, how do you train for a marathon? Well, once a week I'm going to do some sprint work and then I'm going to do a tempo run and then I'm going to do a long run. So I'm going to train three times a week for that and my long run's going to get longer and longer in a periodized fashion as I hit the marathon. And I'm going to do, hopefully, some strength training, two, you know, two days of strength training, some posterior chain and some upper body, such that I retain a decent amount of muscle mass and strength while I'm doing it. Why is CrossFit any different? So recently, I wanted to, you know, to make a point to train for Fran, right? Fran is 21, 15, 9 of the couplet thruster which is a front squat followed by a press and a kipping pull-up. I'll just write pull-up. And that's obviously body weight. So I look at that and I'm like, okay, here's how I'm going to approach it. I grabbed, I put... So what else does uh, hyperinsulinemia cause? Well, like I said, it causes downregulation of the insulin receptors and at some point your brain is also going to become insulin resistant. 
And the problem with this is, uh, well, here's an article that came out in uh, Chemical and Engineering News. It's called Alzheimer's Scary Link to Diabetes. So what's the bottom line on the link between Alzheimer's and diabetes? Delamonte takes the most radical stance on that question. Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes affect different parts of the body, but they are manifestations of the same disease. <coughs> Indeed, they're just insulin resistance that's getting turned on in the presence of too much gl glucose in the bloodstream. Um, and sure enough, in this paper, we highlight how an excess of dietary carbohydrates, particularly fructose, alongside a relatively uh, deficiency in uh, dietary fats and cholesterol may lead to the development of Alzheimer's disease. So this is another thing that can hijack it is something uh, is an undigested peptide from gluten. So gluten is a composite protein. It's made of glutenin and gliadin. And one of the undigested gliadin peptides can come over and stimulate a receptor that's called CXCR3. It's going to release zonulin. Zonulin is going to bind to another receptor, and that receptor is going to cause the tight junctions to dissolve, at which point anything can get through unregulated. These undigested peptides are then going to react with an enzyme that's being released to repair the cell, and that enzyme's called transglutaminase. And it's going to make a chimeric structure. And again, here you've got the right genes. You've got HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. Then this chimeric transglutaminase structure is going to get recognized as foreign, and the immune system, the adaptive immune system, is going to start attacking it. And because it came from the enterocytes, the enterocytes are going to get attacked. You now have celiac disease in this case. So if you've got these genes, you're very susceptible to celiac disease. So this whole you know, increase in intestinal permeability is what it's called, this you know, dysfunction of the tight junctions. And it is associated with a variety of autoimmune diseases. It's associated with allergies. Most people don't consider allergies to be an autoimmune disease. It's, it's, it's an immune uh, disease. Ankylosing spondylitis, a really harsh type of arthritis that attacks the sacroiliac joint in the bottom of the spine. What do you eat? <laughs> what do we eat now? This is what you suffered through the whole day for. Okay? So if I were to take the conservative approach, and then there's people that will come up to me and like, oh, man, but I like to bake. You know, what do I do? Well, you know, you can get yourself this little book called Cooking with Coconut Flour, and then get yourself some tapioca flour, too, depending on what you want to make. The mix of coconut flour and tapioca is better. Get yourself some dextrose, and just whenever they call for sugar in here, use dextrose instead, and you can make cakes and muffins and not look like a complete freak when it's a kid's birthday and there's no cake on the table. Meal frequency, if you have someone that's got metabolic syndrome, having more meals throughout the day is really going to help. You know, some, someone who's really stressed, too, having more meals throughout the day is going to help. Otherwise, you have three meals a day. It's fine. If you get into the, like, the two or one, then you're getting into intermittent fasting country, and that's different. But whether it's you know, three meals a day, eight weeks a day, it's been shown that for normal people, it just it has no uh, effect. Are we, are we done? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.